Another is truly at the edge of the world, the easternmost town of Russia. Further to the east, there are just a couple of villages, the Bering Strait and Alaska. It's the administrative center of a region where Roman Abramovich is worshipped like God. Actually, he was a bit above God, because he was tangible. While I seem to be less welcome here... Wait a minute, what is that? Hey! After visiting this town, Moscow winter won't seem that bad to you. That's what you get when you forget to close the window in Chukotka. It's also the only place in Russia where prices on buckwheat haven't got up recently. Here it costs like a good steak on the mainland, though. At the Chukchi Peninsula, Americans should have been introduced to the famous Kuzma's mother. Since this is the part of Russia closest to the USA, it meant that we would threaten Americans from here. You should totally visit another and leave it soon after arrival. However, it might be problematic to do for the first attempt. Due to the harsh weather, you can spend several days waiting for your flight. So people just sit down and wait. Sitting and waiting is very common in Chukotka. During this trip, I visited an abandoned town. The only functioning building left here is the courthouse with a shabby flag. A former resident of Abramovich, this gate hasn't been opened for some time. An old military base which was once used to store a nuclear weapon has survived a severe snowstorm. The wind is strong, it's all white, like milk. This cold region is inhabited by incredibly warm-hearted people. Today I will try to show you the real region of Chukotka as the locals see it. Suddenly the local airport is not bad at all. It really seems that you have landed somewhere in Helsinki, not in another. Border control checks passports of those arriving because there's border area here. Citizens of Russia can enter, but not foreigners. A seaport and the airport in Ugolnekopi across the river are the only gateways to the town. Getting to the airport is a non-trivial task. It is significantly affected by the weather conditions. During the short summer, there is a boat and a motor ship to the airport. In transitional season, which is May, October and November, helicopter is the only way to get to the Ugolnekopi. Most of the time of the year, it's winter and you can reach the airport by driving on ice. If there is no snowstorm, of course. Otherwise, you'll have to stay in another for a bit longer than planned. Only an off-road vehicle can bring you to the airport. Locals divide the history of the region into eras, before Abramovich and after. There are many versions of how he ended up in Chukotka in the first place. Some say it was due to the political ambitions, others say he was in exile here, like it was a way for him to give back to his country. Some people say Abramovich was interested in natural resources. Anyway, Abramovich became a godlike figure in the Chukotka region. You should take into account the fact that Chukotka was a shithole before Abramovich. Yes, in the Soviet times the region had a strategic importance. After all, Alaska just stepped away from here. But after the end of the Cold War in the tumultuous 90s, everyone forgot about Chukotka. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the population decreased by three times. It fell from 150,000 people to 50,000 people. Everyone who could afford a flight left the region. People were literally exchanging their apartments for tickets to Moscow. As of today, Chukotka is one of the least populated regions of Russia. Only the region of Nenets Autonomous Okrug has less people. Why do people leave from here? We have a saying. It's informal, not documented anywhere. People were squeezed from here like toothpaste out of tube. Just imagine, total mess, no roads, everyone's leaving. People are abusing alcohol, the only means to survive are reindeer and the sea. Towns are full of deserted, half-destroyed houses. There are wild dogs in the streets. So Abramovich arrived to this kind of environment. He won the election easily. However, malicious tongues claim that he simply threw money at the voters. His lads supposedly went to reindeer herders' camps and remote villages, inquired about their needs and then, like wizards, brought them what they wanted. After winning the elections, he started developing the region. 
a new airport was built, buildings were painted in bright colors, new public buses were purchased. Overall, most domestic issues common for developing countries were tackled. Since 2003, the population of another has grown by one and a half times. It was not about people from the outside suddenly moving to Chukotka, but people from dying out villages moving to the center of the region. The exact amount of the personal funds that Abramovich spent to develop the region is unknown. According to some estimates, he spent at least 2.5 billion dollars. Considering the mess that was here before Abramovich, the region has noticeably changed. By the way, what do you think about Abramovich? Abramovich, great man, he lives a good life and he let others live. So, mostly like him here. People like him here? Of course, look how much he did. He got the roads asphalted and look at the houses. All in all, he visibly improved the town. We used to have no roads, you could break your legs walking here. Do you like Abramovich? Be honest. He's a great man. So you like him? Yeah. Everybody who I meet here adores Abramovich. Few people recall that money that Abramovich invested in the region had been gained in the 1990s in a rather shady way. That painting houses does not make any real difference for the Chukotka region. That in fact, Abramovich is beneficiary of the system, which leaves the region like Chukotka almost no hope. What do people generally think of Abramovich here? I can tell you for myself, I think I don't like it. It's unfair how he made his fortune, he stole the money from others. Abramovich, how exactly did he improve the region? Didn't he? He painted houses. You can wrap sh** in whatever you want, it won't become a candy. It's still sh**. He's a crook, don't you see? First he plundered two men, not the city of two men, but a town next to it, Noyabrsk. Then he came here, bought the votes. He brought with him a ship loaded with food. No, he didn't do any harm to Chukotka, but he's still a crook. Our kids will still suffer from his actions. There's something to be mentioned here. Regarding the billions of Abramovich invested in Chukotka, he registered in another together with some members of his team. Thus, tax revenues here increased significantly. But wait, the Chukotka region used to be a domestic tax haven until 2003. Companies registered in Chukotka got a huge income tax abatement. Some branches of Abramovich's owned Sibneft were registered in Chukotka, despite not doing any economic activity here. According to some sources, branches registered in Chukotka were buying oil from other branches at a lower price, and then selling it back at a much higher price. So it was the Chukotka branch that was taxed the most, and it had significant tax abatements. By law, 50% of the money saved in taxes should be invested in the region. Bramovich claimed that in his case it was 100%. From 2001 to 2003 that would make 1 billion dollars. Investing in the region helped Abramovich to get away with the auditing chamber's check that was initiated in 2003. So money invested by Abramovich in the Chukotka region was mainly the money he saved on taxes. An entire era has passed since Abramovich was governing here. So the staff and the quality of service that was here in times of Abramovich are not here anymore. Everything worse now? Of course. When he came here, it attracted people to the region. A lot of high-paid public servants came here. Was he residing here also? No, he wasn't. He was one of the first remote governors. So he didn't leave here, but he came sometimes to check on the region. Did he come often? Yes, especially in the beginning. He came here as a state Duma deputy in 1999. The following year he became a governor. For the first three years he spent most of his time in Chukotka. Wow! Because the region was literally in tatters. There was major issues here. He visited around 95% of settlements here. Listen to people speaking good and bad about him, but as a rule, after his departure, all problems were solved. 
So locals like him, don't they? Yeah, he's godlike here. There was God and there was Abramovich. Maybe Abramovich was a bit above God because he was tangible. By the way, this comparison is not a joke. In a survey of 2005, locals were asked how they perceived Abramovich. The second most popular answer after governor was God. No wonder in the Chukotka Heritage Museum Center in Anadyr, there is a walrus tusk with Abramovich carved on it. He's pictured saving people from starvation. Prime Minister Mishustin came here just to familiarize himself with the region, right? Yes, he had a kind of a tour of the Far East, Magadan, something else. The day he came, Chukotka was paralyzed for six hours or so. I was flying from Providenia to Anadyr that day. It was horrible. The flight was delayed several times. Another was blocked completely. He just visited a hospital and a greenhouse. From what I heard from my friends, there was even a sanitary flight delayed that day while he was in the hospital. During the Cold War, the Chukotka region was of high strategic importance. Almost the whole second half of the 20th century, the US and USSR were competing in politics, economics and science, without actually confronting each other. The Gedim missile base was a storage for nuclear weapons. In the late 1980s, Gorbachev and Reagan agreed on gradual disarmament, so nuclear weapons were removed from Chukotka. When Khrushchev was speaking about Kuzma's mother, he meant that we had nuclear missiles in Chukotka. Since this is the part of Russia closest to the USA, he meant that we would threaten Americans from here. Another interesting thing. You've probably heard about the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. So the operation of deploying missiles to Cuba had a code name Another, like Operation Y. In the famous Soviet film, Operation Y was the operation to break in a warehouse they called it why for nobody to find out about their plan. For some time after removing the nuclear weapon, the premises was used as a storage for the military community. But in the early 2000s it became completely deserted. Once a top secret facility, it is now open to anyone. When Abramovich was here, people used to say that he wanted to buy that facility because it's really great, it's a true underground city. There were concrete walls several meters wide and sealed gates. He wanted to use this facility to store nuclear waste. Just bring the waste and lock it here. This is not confirmed information, but that's what rumors said. Well, it never happened anyway. When you get inside, your first thought is why wasn't this facility transferred for civil use? It could serve as a museum or at least as a vegetable warehouse. Because when it functioned, the average annual temperature was 5 degrees Celsius without heating. That's underground. Here's a narrow gauge railway. In fact, the facility is well preserved. Here's an example of frost heaving. Both entrance and exit are open. There is a trap, so the soil is stabbed, you see. When I first came here in 2007, the ground was still perfectly flat. There is a curve here. It's common for facilities like this. Have you been to Balaklava? There is an underground submarine base and turns are also built at an angle of 30 degrees there. This angle helps to dampen the shockwave in case it explodes outdoors or if it explodes here. This is a metal concrete structure here. There is nothing you can do about it. The dashboard is over there. There are manual and electric controls. This thing used to close the gate. It was impossible to cut or blow up. If you try to blow it up, everything else will fall down. Look at this! Sinks! What a time to wash your face! But the taps were stolen. If only there were taps, we could wash hands, take a shower, but the taps are stolen. Sorry. Here's a panel room. Everything seemed to be in place. Not everything. Well, yeah, some things are in place.
It's only been a couple of decades that life in Chukotka is more or less similar to that in other regions of Russia. Another was founded as a trading post in the end of the 19th century. Later on, there started commercial salmon fishing here. Another chum salmon is considered the best in the world by taste. Since 1906, two reefer ships started coming here to another Skilima. They were just invented and immediately were used here. They delivered fish from here, among others, to the emperor himself. A lot of people fairly assume that Chukotka's weather is harsh. Average annual temperature in the region is minus 7 degrees Celsius. In winter it can drop as low as minus 40. In fact, it's even worse. Chukotka is believed to be the one of the windiest places in Russia. It makes the cold here even more unbearable. There is a joke saying that travel speed of a person in Chukotka is higher than of that in Maylet resident, because otherwise people would simply freeze. Chukotka gets little precipitation. Well, in most parts, at least. Here, in another, the average annual precipitation is around 300-350 mm. In this regard, it is similar to deserts and steeps. In recent years, due to the warming, there has been a bit more generous rainfall, but it's still not significant. Speaking about snow, here in another and further along the coast, it is rock hard. It's not a lot, but it's hard as rock. You can walk on it. On the mainland, there are two, three meters of snow, and it's fluffy. It turned out to be colder than I thought. It seemed to me that after visiting Oymikonsky district, Yakutia, one of the coldest places on earth, where it was minus 45 Celsius when I went there. By the way, you can also watch my video from there. So after minus 45 degrees in Yakutia, I thought another would feel like a seaside resort, like we would feel like in Maldives, we would be wearing swimming suits. Well, not really. Probably there is a different level of humidity here. Now there is a moment of creativity. This bus stop is a youth art project called New Look. So what is a new look? There are pictures of mountains, ships and something else. And there is also a bus timetable here. Coming from Moscow, we are used to crossing streets wherever we want. One crosswalk is here, the other one is there, while the bus stop is over here. So, if I see my bus coming, how am I supposed to catch it? This street must have been designed by fools. Wait a minute. What the hell? Hello, that's how you welcome me? There are no house intercoms in Chukotka because it's so cold outside. Everyone should be able to enter a building just to warm a little. I once saw a lady going out for a second just to pick something up. The door closed and she was left outside wearing her bathrobe in minus 40 degrees. This is an ancient Chukchi tradition. When you feel cold, you can enter a building to hug the heater there. Windows are covered with snow like this. It's not so bad here. My garage can sometimes get covered in three meters of snow. That's amazing how snow affects the architecture. I don't understand why architects in the north do not think it through. You see here snow is completely covering the window. That's strange. Why to put window sills? They are probably beveled, overall very ill-considered. Architects didn't do their job. These standard panel houses are no match for this climate. How can you clean the snow when the window is blocked? Daylight cannot enter through these windows. Here you can see what happened to the houses that had been painted. All the bright colors... The paint is peeling off. As a result, the house looks very poor. 
So that's where he used to live? Yes, one of them is still used as a residence. So it's maintained and everything? Yes, of course. There are workers looking after it. So these are the three houses. Those are houses for workers. And these are the three houses. The first one is the residence. The second is for guests. The third one is a bathhouse. I am approaching the gate of Abramovich house. This is the house. As you see, the gate stayed unopened for quite some time. This is the first revolutionary committee of Chukotka Memorial Complex. In December 1919, a group of comrades staged a cope and seized power. Some shops were nationalized. Forty days after, there was a counter cope. The comrades were executed over there at the Kazachka River. Dear dog owners of Anadir, special plastic bags were invented long ago for you to clean after your dog. Otherwise, it looks like a public toilet. We came here to this beautiful view point. The idea was to admire the view of the amazing Chukotka. But there's dog shit everywhere. Minus 25 here feels like minus 100. Just like this. So guys, as you see, it's awesome here. Chukotka, snow, more importantly, sunset. Most of my viewers are sleeping now, because it's only 1 a.m. in New York, so you are probably in your bed. And I'm here on this hard Chukchi snow, already done with my day. Isn't it wonderful? How people in Chukotka start their day. Did they get up? look in the window and realize there is a blizzard outside. So this is my window. This is my window. So guys, let's go out in blizzard. It says push. We are leaving the building, and I'm not sure where I'm going. Already, after an hour of blizzard, there are huge snowbanks. You fall as you're walking on them. You can't see anything. This is a real snow hell here. This is man-high snowbank. You can still pass here. So what is a blizzard? It's a snowstorm with zero visibility, and it's horrible. There's the strongest wind here, everything's white as milk. Only 10 meters in front of you are visible. There are no sidewalks, nothing. It's such a mess. The issue is that you can't see anything at all. <laughs> What is that? I can't see what kind of a building is that. Wind speed reaching up to 35 meters per second. The airport is closed, people stayed home, most services are suspended. It's really a sort of a hell outside. Nothing is visible. You can't see further than 10 meters. Gusts of wind can blow a person away. You can't be lying in this wind. You can't be walking. This is a true hell. This is a real nightmare. I have never seen anything like this before. Traffic lights are not working. In this weather, the worst part is that something may fly at you and hit you in the head. How often is the weather like this? There was another blizzard two weeks ago. This one will last for a day, but the one two weeks ago was there for a whole week. A week like this? It was a bit lighter. In this considered strong? Yeah. Not the strongest possible. What does the strongest one feels like? Gantry cranes fell down in the port. It was 54 meters per second. How many times can this happen in one season? 
five, six times on average. It is usually a blizzard with a wind of 20, 25 meters per second. So we are lucky to see one. Yeah, you are lucky in terms of polar lights and in terms of blizzard. Have you ever been blown off your feet with the wind? Of course, it was especially scary when I was walking over there. We were going to the cinema with my daughter. We turned to that street and faced the strong wind which blew us to the roadway. Our camera is going crazy with this wind. That's what a building entrance looks like in the morning. It was cleaned with a mop. But look at the windows. They are all covered in snow. There's so much snow that a car can't go here. Everyone is waiting for a tractor. Only special vehicles can get around here for now. I remember walking here yesterday in the same street and the wind was blowing me off my feet. It was impossible to walk. Today though, everything is fine. It's sunny and the weather is really nice. The most important now is that they clean the runway at the airport so that we can leave this beautiful place. What is special about the Chukotka region is that all the goods are delivered here in summer for the whole year. So while prices in the rest of Russia are going up now, Chukotka is not affected by it because the goods have already been brought here in 2020. So the inflation rise occurs here starting from a new shipment, but it's much higher here. If inflation rate on the mainland is 3-4%, here would be 10-15%. If prices rise, they rise significantly. Just like this, the 1990s crisis started here in 1992, not in 1991, like in the rest of the country, because there was still a kind of a margin of safety. Imagine how much prices will grow after another deferred increase, given that they are already 1.5, two times higher than in Moscow. Apples here cost the same as some tropical mango would cost in the mainland. You might argue that local salaries are higher as well. You are right. According to the Federal State Statistics Service, in 2022, a monthly income of another resident is around $1,800. For comparison, people in Moscow earn $1,500 a month on average. In St. Petersburg, $1,000. In Komi and Tuva regions that I also did a video about, $800 and $830 accordingly. The average monthly salary in Russia is around $830. An opportunity to make extra money is a clue to answer the question. Why do people come to live in Chukotka? They tend to think this is temporary. They'll save up enough money to buy an apartment in Sochi and they'll leave. However, some fall in love with this place and choose to stay here forever. You don't really have to go all the way to Barcelona to enjoy masterpieces of architecture, because there is a local Gaudi here, Mr. Frost, together with Blizzard. This is one of the latest works. The snow sculptures are amazingly beautiful. Not a single architect can ever get close to this. Indeed, nature is much more talented than humans. Here is the proof. Frost and Blizzard have created this wonderful interior design. Who else would be able to create anything like this? Look at the wall texture. Amazing. All this snow and ice buildup. That's funny. Abandoned three-story panel house, abandoned community center. The only function in building is the courthouse with the Russian flag wearing off. This is a monument in honor of aviators, pioneers and defenders of the sky of Chukotka. All these shabby panel houses behind me, that's exactly what Chukotka looked like before Abramovich came here. Having seen these shabby buildings, he decided to have artists paint the houses in bright colors. I'm not really keen on this decision, you know my opinion on such colorful fronts. They don't look so good now, they are peeling off, 
all these colorful fronts. I just want to remind, it's not bright colors in architecture that makes a town vivid, not colorful buildings, but a comfortable, urban environment, heated bus stops, smooth roads, barrier-free environment, safe sidewalks and finally, modern architecture. In 2019, a lot of newspapers wrote that Russia's former president, Medvedev, said that Soviet-like standardized construction projects should be used again. What does it mean? Standardized projects are worked out and later on these panels are made on a production line basis and then houses are assembled on site. Everywhere you go in Russia from Chukotka to Kaliningrad you'll see similar panel buildings. Here they are raised on slits due to weather conditions. Otherwise these are the panel buildings familiar to all Russians. So what's the problem? Yes, at the construction phase it is cheaper because the design costs are waived, panel production runs smoothly. You can even set a panel factory right here. Then you just have to assemble it and done. So what's the problem? The problem is that you can save up to 10% at the construction phase, but during operation there are various troubles. For example, since these houses are not supposed to withstand blizzards, you see there appear a huge snowbank at the corner of the house. When they were erected here, nobody thought about the compass rows, about the aerodynamics, that there will be a huge snowbank here. Now when the town is abandoned, you can see the consequences, otherwise it had to be shoveled regularly, because no one thought about it while building these houses. Or for example, now we see that all the windows in Anadur are blocked with snow. That's because the windows are in recessed niches, so any blizzard can block them. As a result, people have to stay in darkness or try to clean the windows themselves. I've already talked about ways to make areas above the Arctic Circle comfortable for living, despite harsh weather conditions. I have been always wondering how these five-story blocks appear even in the most remote areas of Russia. When flying over Kamchatka, you can see them among the marvelous woods. I've always been so angry about it. If you look at Norway, you'll see that it's beautiful everywhere. Here is an average Norwegian village. There are several hotels here, some restaurants and shopping street. There are blocks of flats as well. And it looks nice. The style is consistent. The houses are colored tastefully. Roofs are mostly black. There are almost no fences except for a house with pets. Even their fence is not taller than a meter. But let's get back to another. In Chikotka they were trying to locate buildings like this. To form an angle. To reduce the wind load. As you can see here, the wind load might be reduced. But the snow one is not. Let's go check that one. This is so-called Turkish house. In 2000s, Abramovich brought Turkish workers here. Okay. A lot of them. It was a Turkish company, Yamare Yirim. They built houses here using their innovate methods. Before, we had only panel houses. They started building like this, with very thin walls. I can't say a lot about the quality of these buildings because they are all different. Each house has a story of its own. One would be warm, the other would be not so warm. You can see these entrances are elevated above the ground. Those ones are not. Okay. It's a whole adventure to get to the entrance. But there are some advantages as well. First of all, you can slide down an ice chute right after exiting the house. Secondly, no one would park their cars here. As all the residents are decent people, the entrance is open for anyone. Nobody steals here. People leave their stuff here, like bicycles, etc. Nothing is tied or locked. There is no lock on the entrance door either. They don't even have a door phone. Because there are decent people living here. None of them is capable of stealing. You know how they say, in the past, people used to leave their doors open. Here, in Chikotka, we still leave our doors open. Okay, it's time for me to go, before I get into another snowstorm. You can see a so-called trickle behind my back. It's a kind of an all-terrain vehicle. It's the main transport here in Chikotka. After a blizzard, after a snowstorm, it's the only way to get 
to the airport. There used to be other off-roaders here, some were tracked, but now this is the best transport here. It's impossible to survive without it here in such a weather. So that was the Chikotka region, another, I hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel, give the thumbs up. Don't forget to press the bell button not to miss new videos. Share them with friends on WhatsApp and Reddit.